I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. We're all creative, wildly. So the first principle is everyone's creative. We all have it natively. It's our birthright. It's what separates us from every other species on the planet. Thing two, that it's a muscle. It's a habit. It's a process, not a product. So acknowledging that creativity is a process, that it's a muscle, and it needs strengthening. The third principle is, and to me this is the aha, is that by creating in small ways every day, by having a habit, and just acknowledging it does not have to mean you move to Paris, start smoking cigarettes, and, and, and wear the beret, and get the new friends, and all these things that are very creative. No, just by creating in small ways every day, building a business, making a meal, baking a cake, um, how you express yourself. It's in those small exercises every day that you actually realize that you have agency to create your life. They're the same muscles, the same muscles yeah. that you use to write in the morning, to practice stand-up comedy. Those are the same exact muscles that you use to create the arc of your life. I think it's important to realize you need that, that flame a little bit. You know, not even a little bit. I think it's one of the most important things in our culture. And sadly to me, and one of the reasons I needed to write the book was because we need to acknowledge that. But I'm always wondering, like, let's say someone's listening to this. They're 40, 50, 60 years old. They want to, they, they've kind of maybe for whatever reason, good or bad, blocked out or not listened to that inner flame yeah. or that, that compass. Yeah. How do you, how do you start to listen to it when, when it's been so long? Um, all right, we'll get started. There's so many ways I want to introduce this guy. Um, I'll just say real quickly, Chase Jarvis, one of the best photographers in the world, also the founder of Creative Live, uh, which is all these master classes on creativity, peak performance, everything. It's if you haven't watched Creative Live, you've gotta you've gotta check out just all of the hundred percent of the episodes that he's had there. I've been on Creative yeah. Live, right? Or yep. a version of yep. it. Yep. Uh and so, so this is Chase Jarvis. You just wrote a book called Creative Calling, which I really think is a Bible of creativity. Like I read and reread. I started folding pages, and I then I realized, that, by the way, <laughs> I, I realized I was folding every page. So then I started like outlining, but I didn't always have a pen around. And so I don't know. I just ended up essentially realizing every page is going to get folded, and I'll have to <laughs> figure it out as I go along here. Um, but first off. I have to give you a big thank you that's three years overdue. 
When I was on your show, the first thing I asked was, how can I be a better photographer? I had never really been a photographer, but I was always intrigued. I love looking at photography and I wanted to learn what you would say. And um, you said to me, uh, find out what kind, figure out what kind of people you like to look at. And I said to you right away in response, sad people. And then um, you said, okay, go outside, find someone who's sad or you like their expression on their face and go up to them and say, hey, can I take your photograph? Which was, I thought was an interesting way to do it as opposed to just taking their photograph because there's that extra, that there's that extra challenge there, which upon thinking about it was interesting because that proves you really want to do something artistic. If you force yourself that extra challenge of going up to them and, and, asking them, yeah. hey, can I take your photograph? So actually, can I show you the first photograph please, I took? Please that do. That day. Please uh, do. Uh, then later I put it on on Instagram. I remember I was in a restaurant shortly after and I saw a guy who, I was in a hotel restaurant and, and I didn't know if this guy was traveling or foreign or he just looked kind of sad and, and intense. So I took his picture and then for for about a month, I started taking pictures like that every single day and you know, not that I no, gave but, up, but I just moved on to to different things. But but how did that how did that process feel like? Oh, right? so, I loved it. And you know, other people I noticed other people I knew, like in my different communities, I would interact with and so on, would start posting. Hey, everybody, start checking out James's photo of the day because I was doing it every single day. I would challenge myself to do it every single day. Um, let me find the first one. Uh, oh yeah. This guy, he was just sitting in the restaurant and I went oh right up God. to him. That's amazing. Wow. This was the first. This was that was this the first one. Following your advice. Exactly. I'm good. I went up to him. <laughs> I, I went up to him and I said, can I please take your photograph? And he said in some kind of accent, you know, sure. And I went up really close and, and took That's it. An and I really photograph. I think that actually ended up being the, the best one out of the, out of the month. But then I started doing it every day for quite some time. Like uh, you'll you'll appreciate some of these. Like um, uh, like like there was this one. I was just walking by Times Square and saw this situation. Two people kind of like lying on the ground. Wow. N not as good as that first one though. I think in composition. Compositionally, it's not as strong as the first one. This one that I'm looking at now, but. Take, for example, like that is definitely, there's emotion in this photograph. Yeah. And part of that, there's this human connection component, especially because you said you wanted to photograph people and you don't have to coach them necessarily. That's sort of manufacturing a photograph, but just connecting with them even for a moment is, it, it, it elevates the photograph dramatically. I mean, it, this is a secret that I think most people wouldn't acknowledge. And for example, when you, you asked me, and my, it was an intuitive answer. I mean, I remember you saying, hey, before it was like, I was 10 seconds, I was just finishing my intro. And you're like, wait a minute, I have a question before we start. And I was like, James, we've already started. And you said, no, no, how do I be, take better photographs? And it was just my intuition that said, connection. And that photograph that you showed me is evidence. And it's also evidence of another thing, that we're all creative wildly and you know this about yourself we can talk about it in a second but um to me your ability to pick up a photograph or to pick up a simple technique and execute it on day one how many hours after we did our podcast like to me that's that's remarkable well well i really what you just said was very interesting connection because let's take that and i i have 30 photographs here but I, I, we don't obviously we're not going to go through that <laughs> but uh but in that first photograph i was really feeling empathy mm -hmm. for this man on a journey who seemed either sad or lonely or whatever. Whereas in that second photograph where these kind of like no connection. drunk kids or whatever were just lying on the sidewalk, passed out, I did not, I felt to myself, instead of, instead of feeling any kind of empathy towards them, I felt to myself, this will make a good picture, which is the wrong way I, to think. I think that disconnects that that's like the circuit breaker for the creativity. Yep. You have the, the circuit is that back and forth empathy and connection that you develop with the subject, whether you're writing or photographing or even doing comedy or playing a game, it's that back and forth. You have to keep that circuit open and that's where the creativity is. So true. 
And then there was another thing I noticed too, which is that when I took a good photograph and let's say I posted it on Instagram, I wouldn't care at all, like zero, how many likes it got. Like I could, I had yeah. negative care. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> if I took something and I'm like, oh, I want this to be a good photo, then I cared. And it's the same thing with writing. When I write something and I finish that last sentence yep. and I know this is good, I'll post it. I'll never look again at the likes or the shares or whatever. But if I post something and I'm like, oh, I, I, I hope this is good. Then I can, then I need the outside validation to tell me. And then the creativity is, I know that I just know that the article is not as the writing is not as good and, yeah. and so on. So true. So and I think that the, there's, we have these internal measures and we also have uh, judgment that we carry around with everything. And I think when you're in your purest element of creativity, you're not actually judging. You can't be judging and creative at the same time. That's a great point. Wait, can I write that down? <laughs> Do I have a, I have a notebook. Hold on. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you mentioned exactly that in those words in, in the book, having read the book several times over now. Uh, I really, yeah, I, I appreciate that, man. And it's fun to see uh, a really dog-eared version of your book out in the world. When, when you're judging, or you can't be judging and creating at the same time. Yep. But, but, but riffing on that, um, you do need to uh, assess, at, in your, particularly, well, we're always in a learning phase. So as you're kind of in the, high, the, the steepest part of the learning curve, you need to have some sort of internal feedback so you can improve. Sure. So what's the difference between that and judging? One is when you're creating, and then when you stop creating, you can judge. <laughs> but you can actually be in that moment at the same time. Or you can be, but that's to me, that's not like creative flow, for example. Right, creative flow is a good way to put it because yeah. so so in, in elements of flow, you kind of lose sense of time, you lose sense of other, let's say, other paths to live your life. You're just focused on what you're yeah. doing because you have this enormous uh, pleasure. And maybe wh when do you think, at, at what point in learning the creative process do you do you have that flow that lasts after the creative project that creative project is finished but you still don't care about the validation because well, sometimes think, you do care about the validation sure, for many for sure. reasons and i think because we're human right and we've been you know we, we need to exercise judgment in so many areas of our life right um like how to behave how to behave with others how to behave with ourselves self talk all these things that we that where judgment is is helpful and in shaping who you are and who you want to be, and then to be able to turn that off in the moment of creativity—that's a—that's a muscle. That's a—that's a habit that we can get into. So to me, there's this—it's—it's um, it's not hard to understand why it's confusing for our body and for our our brain, um, but it is necessary to turn that off. I think to do your best work. Think about what you just said about writing earlier. Like when you you're done writing something, you just put it. You know you you period on the last sentence and you're, you're happy to share it. And it's because you know intuitively. And there's, the book is huge on intuition, as you know, like this in, is starting to trust yourself, know yourself authentically. Um, and, and to me, that's a, a muscle that we develop. I think, you know, if we go to the 30,000 foot level for a second, the book has a couple really key principles. One is that everyone is creative and it's not going to be a surprise for your audience. I mean, I listen to your show you talk about creativity a lot, stand up, improv. It's like there's so many elements of you and your personality and, and your community here on the show that know this, but we also forget it sometimes. And so it doesn't hurt to put that as a stake in the ground. So principle one is that we're all creative. Principle two, that is this creativity is a habit. It's not a skill. It's a way of being in the world. It's a way of operating. It's a process, not a product. And it's a muscle. That's what I mean by a habit. It can, um, you can develop it. I feel like I feel like you're taking the words out of my mouth. I think that's really important. That it's a it's a muscle. It's not, uh, you know. Yes, there there is some component of of talent and and nature with with everything. I think, but you know, if if you don't, if if you were kind of um, in a bicycle accident, say, and, and we're stuck in bed for a few weeks, you would literally need physical therapy to walk again because yes. your leg muscles would atrophy. I think people don't realize, and I think this is a very important message, is that, and, and, you, and you, you kind of solidify it in this book, you have to exercise that creativity muscle every day or it will atrophy. And I think a lot of people who, who get fooled by 
not fooled, but they go through the school system, they go through the normal scripting of, of life, the normal script of how to live your life, they forget to we all do. excise this muscle. Yeah, we all do. And that's why I, I, this book is not about shaming people into being more creative. This yeah, is, I almost this, feel bad the way I just said no, that. No, no, no. It's, it, I, I think it's fair because it, that is very, uh, a lot of books do that and I worked really hard to make that not true. But that second principle, so the first principle is everyone's creative. We all have it natively. It's our birthright. It's what separates us from every other species on the planet. Thing two, that it's a muscle. It's a habit. It's a process not a product, and that by you know the, the developing a muscle, the way you do that is through using it and acknowledging it, right? You, when you go to the gym, like, okay, cool, I'm going to spend some time working on my, uh, my physicality, which is an important part, or if you get in a bike accident, like, I need to spend some time and recover. So acknowledging that creativity is a process, that it's a muscle, and it needs strengthening. The third principle, assuming you buy one and two, is, and to me, this is the this is the aha, is that by creating in small ways every day, by having a habit and just acknowledging it does not have to mean you move to Paris, start smoking cigarettes and, and, and wears the beret and gets the new friends and all these things that are very creative. No, just by creating in small ways every day, building a business, making a meal, baking a cake, um, how you express yourself. It's in those small exercises every day that you actually realize that you have agency to create your life. They're the same muscles, the same muscles yeah. that you use to write in the morning, to practice stand-up comedy. Those are the same exact muscles that you use to create the arc of your life. And to me, this was this was my like 20-year synthesis of, oh my God, what creating in small ways, it helps me understand that I have agency in creating the biggest things, whether it's a book that takes many years to write or ultimately your life. So to me, the like those three principles, and you know, we can dive into. There's plenty to un uncork yeah, yeah. in We're, each of oh, those things, me. of course. We're but, going to unpack, <laughs> but uh, it just to me that those are um, those are things that you could understand. You know, after I mentioned them, you could stand back and like, yeah, that makes sense. But why are these like? Why isn't that not a central concept in our culture to value and appreciate creativity? In fact, it's just the opposite. We're sold this narrative that some people are creatives and some people aren't, that creativity is a nice to have. It's kind of like a, oh, oh, he's so creative. And it's sort of put in air quotes. And But the reality is, not, as, not only is creativity not naive, not only is creativity not just a nice to have, this is as fundamental as nutrition, as exercise. It is literally the building, like it's, it's the muscle that can allow us to do everything. So, so why do you think it's not... Um, you know, appreciated in our culture the way you just described? Because I think creativity was early on in culture was associated specifically and only with art. Art equaled creativity. What we understand now is that all these other processes, building a business, uh, again, raising a family, these are all aspects where if you if you subscribe to the definition of creativity that I put forward in the book, which is just, you're combining two things that used to not be together. You're putting them together in a way that's new and useful. And in in pop culture, when we try and associate something, um, for example, creativity with with just art, well, art to me, of course, I have my own view on art, and I think it powers the world, and it's you know it's incredibly empowering, inspiring, and shows us um, what's possible. But if you expand the definition of creativity to include, as I just did right there, it's basically everything. It's the building block of everything you know. To me, that all of a sudden gets really interesting, that the biggest, the solutions to the biggest problems that the world will ever have and ever know, access to clean drinking water, uh, humanitarian crises, all these have fundamentally some creativity required in order to create a solution. And even on, even on just like a human personal level, like if you kind of step out of the box a little bit during each day and experiment with doing some creativity, yeah. I just think it leads to a happier, richer life. For sure. There's more depth there. And, and again, I don't want to get too, um, too analytical or too academic or pedantic because we all know what creativity is. And you just ask, and here, here's just a simple litmus test. Ask any first grade classroom, who wants to come up to the front of the room and draw me a picture? Every single hand goes up. Because 
we think of kids like, oh, it's so cute. They want to just, because we're, we're self-expression machines. We're, we're literally creating machines. That's what we do. We go around and we say, okay, am I going to go right or am I going to go left? You're creating the path of your day just in that simple decision. And you can look at that first grade classroom and see the raw, this beautiful energy that we are creating machines. And then you ask that same question of a, say a sixth grade class. And then again, you know, when they're 20 and it's dramatically reduced. And that is like half as many hands go up in sixth grade. And then just a few souls are brave enough at the end of the schooling system to get up on stage and do some stand up or whatever the thing is. And that's because, not because of who we are innately. We know that from the first grade classroom. We have a culture that starts to prescribe a bunch of shoulds and oughts and musts to our world. Yeah, and, and again, I don't think, I used to think there was just bad motives behind society doing that. Like, okay, let's prepare uh, an army for the industrial revolution or yeah. for an actual army, mm -hmm. in which case you don't want them to be creative. You want them to fill a slot on the assembly line or yeah. be a soldier and follow orders. Um, I used to kind of think that that was yeah. the ulterior motive of society, but there's another motive, which is that society also wants to protect people. Yeah. So you want people to grow up and be adults and be able to feed themselves and kind of all learning the same skill sets uh, uh, allows allows people to do that. You can get yeah. a job working in the factory and feed your family and, yep. and so on. Yeah. But, uh, and creativity is sort of left behind. You have to leave something behind and creativity is the easiest thing to leave behind. And you know, we, we got kind of got right into it. I wanna, <laughs> I wanna do a little bit more intro on you you had you've had such a fascinating story but i want to i want to ask this this one question first and we'll get into more later but recently i've made kind of a a switch in my own thinking about uh creativity so there's like a just like you there's several different areas i'd like to be creative at i i i write i i write every day or try to write every day i do other things and recently i've gotten more into the what what now i've read in the philosophy of your book just thinking, I, I used to say to myself, if I don't write every day, I'm going to lose the ability to write. And I would panic even if it was the end of the day and I haven't yet written, you know, my thousand or 2000 words. But now I realize I'm a little bit more relaxed and I realize if you just are creative every day and do yeah. something that's creatively satisfying every day, that's almost good enough. I might yeah. not improve immediately more skills as a writer, but, but here, I've been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. It's okay. It's good to be just to have that exercise, that muscle every day is is important. It's super true, and and I had to forgive myself on, well, on certain days. I forgive you too. <laughs> you don't need to hear it from me, but I think that's what what one of the reasons it's so easy to say that is because you've mastered writing, James. You're you're a master. You've been doing it for thirty years. You've got way more than ten thousand hours, and once this, you know, I talk about this to me. Learning the connection between learning and creativity is fascinating, and we talk a lot about it in the book. The that when you are when you've mastered something, you it's more than just it's like the distance between nine and ten is not just one. It's really close. It's like it's psychologically it's less than one. It's so close to ten. And now that you've mastered something, you can actually you understand what it takes to master something. And so you're actually further along in every other discipline because you've deconstructed what it takes to be a, a world class writer. And you can start to apply that lens to lots of other things. And you can't actually, there's, there's no shortcuts, but you can take the most direct path for you that you could possibly take because you've deconstructed what it took for you to master something. It was a combination of hard work and deconstruction and joining communities and all these other aspects. When you've mastered something, it's easier to master the next thing and you end up getting a lot of benefit from play in other areas. So don't be so hard right. on yourself. You've mastered writing this creative cross training, cooking meals, uh, practicing stand up comedy, whatever it is, travel, adventure, those things are only fueling your writing in a way that you, uh, that benefits it. But did you ever go through that? Like, for instance, when you started your creative live company, sure. which why don't you describe what creative live is? And then I'm sure, going sure. to ask you about, about the relationship between that and your other stuff. Sure. So creative live is the world's largest platform specifically uh, for learning for creators and entrepreneurs. It's where people like Richard Branson, Brene Brown, Tim Ferriss, Ariana Huffington, and all kinds of other Pulitzer, Grammy, 
Oscar winning folks go to teach and share their, their information. And so it's an online learning platform. You can buy individual classes or subscribed. And, uh, we have, um, tens of millions of people have used the platform. Uh, it's a community, an active community of millions. And we've, um, there's a free product as well. You can go there and watch anything 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you don't have any money. And we've given away billions and billions of minutes of free video. Uh, and we're not 10 years old, um, and I still sort of feel like we're just getting started. So so as you were starting this, and even to this day, did you ever feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing as much uh, of those amazing photographs I did 15 years earlier? Uh, are people going to forget about me as a photographer? Like, do, the, do these thoughts of doubt ever cross your mind? Because you've kind of built your creative, you laid the bricks of your kind of professional creativity on on, on top of photography. Yeah, yeah. And this is, uh, I'm trying to portray what I think is a natural progression. Like, I believe that getting into something that at a depth, first of all, you know, how we get into the things that we are we know we're supposed to be doing in this world, like paying attention to our intuition. For me, photography spoke to me from early, early age, rather than getting into that lineage, just know that, to, so that to answer your question, I don't want to go back too far, but, and and so through a bunch of missteps and pursuing a bunch of things that everybody else wanted from me, spending hundreds of thousands on student loans and basically making every mistake you can make in the book, I found a way through some trauma and through um, through luck I, I got into photography and I sort of was able to make the thing that I had always thought. I, I was really curious about photography. I was able to make my way in that world. And when, as soon as I stepped on that path, I talk about hearing your calling and stepped on that path, things just got easier. Not only did my career in photography accelerate, but life felt better. It got easier. It's like the 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 skids were greased. And, and when I mastered photography over the course of however many 10,000 hours or whatever your acknowledgement is, would be for mastering something, I found that I, I had an inspiration and a desire to continue to move and explore and grow. And that came with just like every new anything, a lot of fear, a lot of um, self-doubt, a lot of frustration. And it was exactly the same thing with Creative Live. That was an entirely new world for me. Um, I even developed some iPhone apps. It was sort of like an interim stage between being a photographer. That was my on-ramp to the startup world is I did the first iPhone app that allowed you to take pictures, add cool effects called filters, and then share that on social media. It was, ended up being a... <laughs> photography is pretty popular today. Um, but that helped me understand that creativity could be scaled using technology, and that was a, a hybrid step between there and Creative Live. And I had all kinds of mistakes along the way. So was I fearful learning new things? Yes. Uh, was did I make a lot of mistakes? Of course I did, but and were you feel f fearful of losing your connection to your roots in photography? I was to me. I never left photography. I just stopped doing it for Nike and Apple and a lot of the biggest brands in the world and hanging in galleries and stuff like that because I really had and and I still feel this. I have a deep connection to photography. It underpins everything that I do. Um, I'm a visual learner. I think photography is its own language, so I don't feel like I've left it, but I used everything that I learned in that universe to try and experiment and step into some of the new areas for, for which I was curious, inspired, and um, again, motivated to continue to try and have impact. You know, um, while you were talking, like you, you kind of like touched your heart, like in terms of, tr you know, when you were talking about which, you know, when you started doing photography, you realized this was the right path for you. And then it's kind of that feeling of each step of the way where, I, I don't know how to describe it, like where the where the fire is lit and where it's not lit. So for instance, you started taking photographs, but then you, you got involved in another thing that you were interested in, which let's call it extreme sports or sure. snowboarding, skateboarding, yeah. whatever. And that kind of fueled the fire more. So suddenly you, you know, combining these two things, you became very quickly to the top, you know, yeah. the front of the line in terms of the best photographers of photographing these types of things. Yeah. And that was led completely, you called it intuition, but again, you're like touching, you were touching yeah. your heart. So like yeah. some fire is lit that that points you in that direction. And I'll, I'll give you a, a simple counter example. I have, uh, I had and have an opportunity to do a, a TV show about something and I had pitched it, I had gone through all the, the steps, everybody was interested, you know, networks were interested, are interested. And 
but I I stopped for a second because I realized there's something wrong. Like I feel like there's something making me unhappy about the amount of work this is going to require for me, and why. And that normally wouldn't bother me, but why does it bother me? And I realized I had an ulterior motive. I simply wanted to do this to increase fame level, mm -hmm. not that I loved it. Yeah. And so I've been kind of shifting direction since then. And I think it's important to realize you know what what is the reason you're making what are the reasons you're making a certain decision you're going down a certain path and you need that that flame a little bit you know not even a little bit i think it's one of the most important things in our culture and sadly to me and one of the reasons i needed to write the book was because we need to acknowledge that and imagine it's not just you james our entire culture is very busy for not always malevolent reasons. People have good reasons that they want you to do the thing that's safe and predictable and expected. And I call it beige. It's right down the middle. And two things are true. One, that that is a lie. <laughs> so the, the two things are true is one, that, that that is a lie. It comes sometimes from bad motives, but usually because people actually care about you. And the people who don't want to see you take risks are your parents and your high school counselor and your teachers and your friends. And it's because they care about you and putting yourself out there can be risky. All, all the other things that can go along with failure, we understand that. So first of all, that whole thing that you were just sold is a lie. Second of all, and to me, this is the part that um, I think is um, interesting maybe, is that it is, it's not safe. What they're telling you to do, they think they're coaching you to do the safe thing, but now is the riskiest time in human history to do the thing that has always been safe. Right. Because the world is changing so fast. The um, If you don't have a love and a connection and a passion for what you're doing, you're going to be isolated. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be sick. And in a, in a, in a world where we do now have access to tools that we never had that would be free. We do have the democratization of a lot of the platforms, for example, you used to have to you know, be judged by gatekeepers, whether they're the gallerist or the, the movie producer or the, uh, or the publishing house to decide if you could write a book or just express yourself. Now, it's the first time in human history that those gatekeepers are not in a position of power or less power than they had before. So. Not only the, the people that told you those things, they were wrong and they were, they were wrong to think that you would be safe because it's not safe to do the thing that everybody else wants. The safest thing in your journey is to be inexcusably, unapologetically you. Right. Well, think about it from your, from your own experience. You know, you, 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 you took this off beaten path of photography and then you further, uh, took your own path by combining it with your interest in, again, I'll call it exports or sure. extreme sports, whatever yeah. you want to call it. And it's that intersection that this, that your passions took you that allowed you to sort of, you know, comfortably develop the skills and become the best in that intersection. For sure. And I think, I think that's very interesting that because then by following that inner flame and, and, and making turn several times along the way because sure. it's not, you know, you didn't take the same path every photographer takes. Nope. You didn't, you probably didn't take the same path every photographer who likes extreme sports takes. It's probably still was a few more yep. uh, turns that took you to your specific location that only, where only you would live. Yep. And that's where you're able to find kind of the, the pot of gold. And not that it's, you did it for monetary reasons, but that is how you monetize is when you when you are able to take this passion and creativity and use this this intuition or this flow or this flip whatever you want to call it yeah. to to find the place where you're unique and that's you know usually there's a way to monetize at that point which is For what sure. you found yeah and several ways to monetize you you've you've spent you you spent the past 10 years finding several ways to monetize for sure everything that you said is is absolutely true and and i think the part that is um the, the only layer that i would add is that this is not what we're taught this is and it's because it's inconvenient for the school system it's inconvenient for our economic right. engine for employment to teach us these things and again, there's no malevolent puppeteer that's telling you that's trying to you know channel you into working at the factory. But the reality is that our entire 
culture, the images that we see, the parents that we have, the peers, our teachers, our counselors, they, for, for reasonably good reasons that you and I already articulated, they're not meaning harm, but they're giving you advice that is outdated. And there was, there was a time where that was the right advice. If you go to this college, you'll get a good job. And if you get a good job, you work there for 40 years, get the gold watch and everybody will be happy. That's fiction. That's gone. That doesn't happen anymore. And I, I would question whether it ever happened. Right. <laughs> there was a time where in, in industrial revolution and where productions and factories and, and schools were that were that function at a very high level. But the reality is that now, more than ever before, it's an open field. And we've all now also more than ever before have an opportunity to carve our own path. And what that requires is a whole new set of dialogues internally and externally. My book's trying to be that external dialogue and it, hope, it hopes to be able to guide that internal dialogue because the answers about should you pursue stand-up comedy, should, you, should I pursue photography, what part of photography would I do it, how would I do it, all those things are internal. Right, and, and think about it. Like Even asking those questions, you can't think your way to an answer. You could only do things yeah. and see if, oh, was the flame lit? Nope, okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to do something else. I'm gonna, and, and I think ex- experimentation is is a large part of this huge like, huge part you know like you mentioned earlier ten thousand hours it's almost i've also heard people refer to it as ten thousand experiments like you have to do something each day to kind of guide you in your own unique way but let, let's take it a, a a step back so we know sure. um every day creative is important but like let's take you for with photography how did you how did you initially start developing the skills how do you start recognizing that internal flame, you know, and what it means? Because it means something different at each level. Like sure. in the very beginning, when you have no skills, it means this is cool. I want to do this. I want to get better at this. I don't care what people think. Yeah. I'm going to do it. That's what it means the very first time you feel it. Yeah. So what 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 happened? How did you start to go down the path? How did you learn? How, how did you develop the skills, the meta learning skills sure. to get better? Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine. That's M I Z Z E N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes. I'm tra- I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half. And I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional, and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts, our untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Main is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports? 
is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. How did you develop the meta learning skills sure. to get better? Sure. So I'm going to I'm gonna do two things. I'm going to put one thing out there, which is a statement that I also worked very hard on the book, is that... I find books that give you the perfect path from A to Z are totally useless because nothing, like all these processes, whether you're building a business or trying to improve yourself or whatever nonfiction book you're reading that pretends to have it all figured out, life does not mimic that. Life is messy. And so when you ask me what my path was, I want to be sure to identify that I, I've, I can now deconstruct what I think a good uh, model is to follow, but I don't come from a place of holier than thou. I, I mentioned earlier all my missteps and you know I did the first iPhone app at, way before Instagram that, that did the same thing. Instagram is basically lift and stamp copy of best camera and I'm not the billionaire. I lost a billion. Like, so there's plenty oh, of- Oh, and we're definitely going to talk about that <laughs> okay. as well. There's plenty of mistakes along the way. And so um, in discovering what I know now, I just want everybody at home to, who's listening to know that it's all going to be imperfect. And because I'm talking- on a podcast with you. I don't want to pretend I've got it all figured out. And, and, and by the way, I think that's important. That's a good way to kind of a uh, good litmus test on, on self-help books, which is um, I prefer self-help books that are like Mad Libs versus uh, how to. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yes, physical, being healthy physically is important. But then it's a fill in the blanks. Yeah. For everybody, it's going to be different. Some people will eat keto. Some people will be vegetarian. <laughs> some people will go to the gym. Some people will walk up and down the stairs. Sure. So, so for everybody, it's a more like at some point, there's a fill in the blanks component. Yeah. And I think the more of that, the better. <laughs> yeah. Else it's just like, well, okay, then you write in your gratitude journal, then you <laughs> juice kale and all that stuff's like too hard. Yeah. So I get anxious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just start a list of the things that you have to do in order to fill in the blank. Yeah, I get it. Right. But, 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 I, but, you know, I do think how you describe your process sure. will extrapolate. Of course, there's no question. That's why I was just a qualifier, but I do think that, that there's, uh, value in answering the question and talking about my, my individual process. So, um, I remember very distinctly as if it was yesterday, um, my second grade classroom, I loved telling stories. I would perform magic whenever anyone would give me the time of day and I could just capture two or three people in the hallway. I had, I'd carried around little magic tricks and, uh, and I loved to draw and write. I used to draw comics. I had a, my own comic. His name was Clyde. And I, he looked like a combination of Garfield and Grover. And um, and I, I drew comics. 
And then I remember at the student teacher conference, I overheard my mom and my second grade teacher talking. And my second grade teacher said, you know, Chase is much better at sports than he is at art. And I remember in that moment as if it was yesterday. That's a horrible thing to say. Right. And it, but she said it with a smile and they were talking about something innocent and rather innocuous. I heard it in passing. I don't think she meant it. And like, it's not like I was horrible at art, but it stuck with me. And it was clear to me that how my personal path at that point changed. I mean, it was in an instant. And I didn't like not do whatever, if we had an art class, I did the projects, but I began, it shifted my identity from creator or creative to, oh, I think I need to be a jock if I'm going to find acceptance. Well, and, and also, right, so it depends on where your center of kind of personal gravity is. For so, sure. So if it's outside of you, if it's somewhere in between you, your mom, and your teacher, and and sports is kind of Accepted. at that center of gravity, yeah. then that's where you're going to gravitate. For sure, and I did that. And so, you know, why I'm recounting this is, A, how valuable and important it is to understand the words that we use, labels matter, and we're not all little special pre precious snowflakes. We're durable creatures, um, and I'm living proof of that because I just went on a bent that now for basically 20 years or 18 years virtually alienated me from my creativity. I dabble, I got to connect the two one time in my teens when I really, not one time, but for a... a, a, a one path in my teens included skateboarding. And this is where I sort of tapped into that action sports culture and punk rock. And what I realized about skateboarding, and I didn't realize it at the time, but I felt comfortable because it was this connection between being wildly creative and expressive, punk rock, um, spray paint, building skate ramps with your hands and, um, and borrowed tools, and then exploring the streets and defining little little pieces of the concrete and the architecture that you would skate on. Like that was wildly creative and was also very athletic. And and also as you were describing, but I'll, I'll summarize it in one word, skateboarding has this subculture in a way that other sports don't. Yeah. Yes. There's a subculture of people who love football. We all love football. Here's the football stats. Here's fantasy football, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But skateboarding, there's the clothes, there's the music, yeah. there's, there's this, this the, the ethos, graffiti. Almost, there, yeah. There's the youth. There's the the rebelliousness of it. Like yeah. I don't. Where you grew up in Seattle, yeah. but um, you know, in California, the whole West Coast. Yeah, yeah. It was, down, yeah, it, it was kind of made illegal for a yeah. while because yeah. kids were getting hurt, so that made it more underground. Yeah. And, and then you know, exports made it made it big again. So right. so so again, that you were looking for some kind of subculture as well that was creative connection is part of what I was seeking and an explanation of wait a minute how can I. I've been put in a box by my second grade teacher. I was happy to live there because I didn't know any better. And, oh, and then it's like you got a whiff of something that gave you a fuller picture and that connected more dots than you were able to connect on your own. And while I tapped into that, again, I was, it, it, as soon as it got to being able to go to college on a soccer scholarship, that's, you know, skate scene sort of goes away. It's never completely gone because it's a part of you. Yeah. Uh, and, and it was for me, but it put me, my point here is it put me on, a really long detour away from my creativity, almost denying it in favor of where I was getting social and cultural acceptance. And I went to college on a soccer scholarship at one of the top soccer schools in the country. And I was on the Olympic development team. It happened to be a year where there weren't an Olympics, so I didn't, I didn't get to do that part of it. But I was just rewarded and it was good enough to be able to make my way in that, in that area. And then something really uh, horrible happened, which is my grandfather dropped dead of a heart attack. No, no foreseen, like didn't have ailing health and, you know, just boom. Here one day, gone. And he had been, he, both he and my father had been hobbyist photographers. And while I was doing those things, skateboarding and playing soccer and football, the things that I was getting some connection and or some acceptance for, I remember being motivated and inspired by that this is a moment that will never happen again. It wasn't that it was about me or my friends. It was just, I understood the language of photography as this, a moment in time, and there was a whole narrative in a single moment, a thousandth of a second. And when he died, something happened. And it was in that grief and in that moment, I think I was sort of cracked open enough to just take a beat 
even at 20, 21 years old and evaluate my life, just even, even for a moment. And these large moments in life, the birth of a child, the death of a, a, a friend or a, a family member, some trauma that you may have experienced yourself, they can cause us to reflect. And I think they're, they're very, very useful. Um, and yet I wish we didn't have to, I wish we were able to be more in tune with ourselves on a regular basis, such that you could get this from a road trip or a Vipassana or some, uh, some nice way to stumble into this information. But for me, I was cracked wide open and that, you know, the cracking open of the heart, it helps you understand things about yourself. So it, it was there just long enough for me to acknowledge that I was denying what I now know is a very important part of myself, which is my creative self. So and that kicked me into pursuing photography. I was given his cameras. I was willed his cameras. I'd been basically creative, curious, um, photographically inspired because I'd been on the other side of the camera and was attracted to it. And then um, had got a little bit of money from his passing and his cameras. And um, I got a, like a 14 stop plane ticket to Europe with my then girlfriend, now wife, right on the backside of, of graduating college, ate beans and tuna fish and lived out of a backpack for six months and taught myself how to take pictures. And and when you say taught yourself, like obviously you because you're going to so many places and you're you're you were on the move. You weren't you didn't sign up for like no. you know the school of photography and here's like no. courses Monday, Wednesday, and Friday with this no. professor. Like you were, what did you do? You just took pictures and how would you how would you um do you mm -hmm. know kind of the deliberate learning that, that as Anders Ericsson uh, calls it like who was giving you feedback on the pictures so that you could then learn and then you repeat and and so on. So. Uh, my two biggest inputs were um, one, comparing my, my work to the work of others. And in Europe, I remember standing in front of hundreds of magazine stands and looking at the work of the photographers that I admired that lined those pages of those art books and, and, and magazines and saying, wow, my stuff is really, <laughs> it's a far cry from this. And at the same time, sharing it with my, my then girlfriend, now wife, Kate, and because it was of us or she and I or her or a moment that we'd shared together, there was an emotional connection. So I, I got, you know, sort of both the technical understanding of like literally comparing my work to the work of people who were much further along in the process than I was and still getting some emotional validation that images were more than technical. They, were, they weren't about megapixels and dynamic range and perfect composition, that there was some language, some emotion that actually was arguably maybe as important or more important than the technical aspects. So, so, so two things to unpack there. One sure. is uh, mentorship is fine, but virtual mentorship also is fine. In yeah. fact, in some cases it's better because you could have thousands of virtual mentors and those were the people taking those photographs in those magazines. Yeah. This was the inter this was the early this was be internet before the internet was the magazine stand for right. me. Right. No, yeah. I I I this is like I'm assuming this is like mid mid 90s that was kind of like I think the yep. peak of magazine culture like <laughs> yep. all these indie but very, you know, high um production magazines yeah. like they were beautifully produced yeah. You're nailing uh, it. was was out there. Yep. It was kind of like um, the movement from zines to actual magazines. So zines was yeah. like in the 80s, early 90s, but then they became yeah. glossy you, magazines yeah. in the mid-90s. You're nailing the, the cultural arc there. And those, both my wife and the, the unadulterated, like non-judgmental emotional connection that, that reviewing my photos with her created, and then the technical aspect, um, that combination was powerful. And I used to literally, so this was back in film. So I would take a picture and I would literally write it down frame one, F8, a 250th of a second, uh, you know, St. Peter's Basilica, a uh, cloudy day. And then when I got the film developed, I would look at the picture, you know, here's frame one. And then I would look at the exposure and like, okay, was this good? Did I nail it? Or what, what was I learning? And so two things are true. One, how painful that was. And if you, I understand if I skipped one frame, all of my, all of my information would be off. Uh, and two, what does that mean if you skip one frame? Well, if I didn't write down, if ah. I forgot to write down one particular exposure, then the rest of my, um, <laughs> if I skipped one, then I wouldn't have accurate information to then, you know, cause you develop your film like sometimes weeks later. 
and I would not be able to learn effectively if I didn't capture the right information and be able to look at, oh, this was a terrible picture. It was really underexposed. And then I go to look at my notes. If I hadn't taken the right notes or put them in the right spot, then I wouldn't be able to learn from that experience. So it was very slow and painful, very analog way of learning. But that, but that uh, documentation is is really critical. Super critical. So, so like, for instance, in, in, in I'll just say it as an analogy, but uh, in stand-up comedy... You have to take video of your performances yep. because I'm, there might be a time where I think, man, I did I did great. But then I'll watch the video and I'll see, oh, for some reason, I'm hunched forward a little more yep. than I should be. It looks like I'm a little nervous. And now nobody seemed to pick up on that. But the audience, just like with photography, the audience is an x-ray machine. They know they know what's going on behind the scenes and they could, they would just react better if my shoulders weren't hunched. Yeah. Now, but the other thing I, I noticed in what you said is, you're, you would get feedback or you would see if these photographs would elicit a, an emotional reaction from Kate, yeah. which implies you have to have someone around you. You're not going to be defensive. You're, you're going real. to trust. Yeah. Like if she said, ah, I don't feel it, you probably, I don't know what what happened, but my guess is you didn't argue with her. No, you're like, that's what I was looking for. I was like, because there is someone that trust you talked about. Um, and in the in the book, I really framed this. You, you didn't say like, but 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 Kate, this is just the exact same as the other photograph that you did. Like, what's the difference? And and she would be like, I don't know. It just doesn't feel the same. You wouldn't you wouldn't get into down that, that <laughs> rabbit hole. No, because she, like I, she, she is someone who's uh, wickedly creative in her own expressional ways, and I valued her opinion. I was really looking for that unadulterated, unfiltered. Like, how does this feel? Like when you just pick it up or connect with it, and. It was the combination of, again, that technical, but that emotional, to realize that there's a relationship between them, that sometimes you carry in a lot of emotional baggage, both good and bad, to looking at a picture or experiencing some art. And just helped me understand that it was more complex than just technique. And I think this is this this is a really important point. And while technique is sort of what I consider the get-in-the-door fee, like you have to be able to put an exposure together that's good enough in a photograph to be able to see something on the film... Beyond that, it's less about all of those other technical trappings and more about telling a story and making this connection that we talked about earlier with your subject and why I can look at that picture in a minute and say that's a powerful photograph. So this, this, these two areas of feedback that I have and, and the fact that it was very slow going and then there was also a pain point involved. Like if I, in order to develop the film, we were very, I mean, it sounds luxurious because we were, quote, traveling in Europe but we were literally eating cans of beans. And there were days where I literally would not eat in order to end three days from now when we were in Budapest to be able to develop film. And you'd spend 20 bucks on the film development rather than eating. And I, I recognize that this is that, you know, there's a certain amount of privilege to be able to say and do that. And then there are people who don't actually have food. But for me, that was my little universe. And I would trade food for the ability to learn. And right now, if you don't care, if you don't, you know, give any cares about photography, you'd say, who would ever do that? This goes back to the earlier point we were talking about. When you're doing the things that feel good to you, where you're creatively curious or you're finding an, an outlet for your expression, that this doesn't seem like a big trade-off. It doesn't seem like a big deal or where learning gets really easy for you because you're doing something that feels good and resonates internally. To me, that's there. all these things are starting to dovetail for me, you know, you asked the question, like, what was it like to learn photography or to teach yourself? To me, this is the paradigm that we all are on in some way, shape, or form when we learn anything. There's a little bit of curiosity. You pull on the thread, you learn a few things, you get inspired, or you learn a few things. I didn't like this. I used to be an oil painter, too freaking slow. I hated the <laughs> waiting for the paints to dry. There's lots of stuff that I, so I only did that for a little while. And then I, you know, you talked about your zigzag path and I got back on the path of photography and whether you, it's photography or cooking or building businesses, I can look at a lens uh, through this lens now and look backwards and connect the dots that this is the learning process. And why aren't we taught that it's imperfect and nonlinear and exploratory and that you are going to make mistakes along the way. Because if we were framed it like that, we would be A, much more willing to learn and B, probably much more open to it. So so, so there's, there's a couple things I want to ask there. One is when, when you're first starting anything that A, you're passionate about and B, is worth doing, it's a 100% chance you're going to suck 
badly at the beginning. <laughs> I have a chapter in there called Permission to Suck. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, right. You, have, yeah. you say embrace the suck yeah. in this. But there's also the, part of the reason many people keep going, I think part of the reason why I kept going in writing is there's this bias uh, called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which you 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 tend to think you're better than you are at the thing you love. <laughs> yeah. And um, did you ever go through that? Did you of find course. yourself like thinking, "Man, I'm the best photographer"? And I thought I was pretty good by the time of six months of traveling with my grandfather's camera and developing film. You know, every other, every two three weeks, and you know, and then you come back um, to you have camera area, equipment. Yeah, and, all cool. you have, yeah where, <laughs> and you come back to an area where you have more, like a little bit more resources than I had when I was on the road in Europe, like access to libraries and and more books around photography and technique and and importantly like how to figure out how to make some money doing this thing and you start to realize that all these other factors are factors that I had been ignoring and you know this is like life right the more it's like a language you feel like you can communicate and then you're like oh there's lots of different tenses to these verbs like every layer of the onion you peel peel right. back it's like there's a whole another world of learning well that happened to me with photography and part of how I think you know something is something that you love is that either excites you or frustrates you. And there can be a little tinge of frustration in the excitement, even if you, if you love it. But there are also times you're like, okay, I'm completely done. I do not need to spend another minute learning to cook or painting with oils or whatever. I'm fed up. I'm good. But for me, when I got back from that trip, realized, as you said, the denning whatever effect, oh my God, I really actually suck. <laughs> like, I, need to, I need to keep doing this. But I have energy and I see aptitude and opportunity and it brings me joy and you know attuning to these characteristics in not only our creative lives but our lives in general like to me that's where the best stuff is and and i think you use the word joy i think overall joy is more important than um let's say this kind of constant happiness so yeah. for instance if if i'm watching my favorite tv show i'll be constantly happy <laughs> and then at the end of it I'll just have spent 300 hours watching my favorite TV show with <laughs> nothing much to show for it. But like if you're again if you're trying to get good at something that's difficult, there's going to be a lot of points of feeling horrible because yeah. you realize like you're looking at these photos in the magazines and then you're looking at your own photos. There's at some point you every now and then you're going to say, "Oh my gosh, I am <laughs> horrible. I'm never yeah. going to be this good. Right. I'm disappointed in myself. This is not worth it. I'm not happy." Because it can't be all joy. I mean, it can't be all all fun, yeah. or else you wouldn't try to get better. For sure, and this is also where you you cited my my wife Kate on this earlier. But that's why community is so important, and and having the right community for sure, not just any community, and finding a community where you both are welcomed and feel welcome. And uh, there are two sorts of community I talk about in the book. Um, one is the communities that you tap into that exist out in the world, and another is a community that you start to build around your very own work. And to me, like you tap into other communities, you know, I use my own examples to what we've already talked about: the photography community and the action sports community. And then there is a community of people who were action sports photographers. So there's all kinds of communities and sub communities for you to tap into and, and learn and get validation or support or criticism or all those things. And all that is very, very, very useful when there's that gap that you recognize between where you are and where you want to be. And you can get both encouragement and feedback and all those things from, from those communities that exist. And then there's also the work and the community that you start to build around, or sorry, there's the community that you start to build around your work. And at first, it, maybe it is just a community of two, myself and my wife, Kate, when we're backpacking. We didn't have any other audience. There were no other friends and no internet. I wasn't showing it to the random strangers on the, on the street. And then that community, when I got back, expanded to include my parents and my friends and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you start building a community around your work. And this community doesn't have to be millions of people. We can reference Kevin Kelly's uh, article, A Thousand True Fans. If you have a thousand fans in, in, in your corner, you can basically make a living and a life doing what you love. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to have millions of followers on Instagram. What if you're a blacksmith in Jackson Hole, Wyoming? Your community of people who appreciate your work maybe is the 12 restaurateurs who you 
take care of their knives. Whatever the, whatever the size community, it's not about that. But having a community to, to reduce all this last you know, 90 seconds into how important community is to growth, to connection, and to our creativity. And so, so and, and just to also reiterate what you said earlier, I think every path is different. Like uh, my entrance into writing, for instance, is different than your entrance into photography. For sure. There might be some intersection in terms of sacrifice because you always, because you're going to, you're about to embark on spending a lot of hours on something. There's got to be some sacrifice in, in exchange. But my reasons for starting were, were very different and for continuing were, were, were very different. I think also that's related to, it doesn't matter what age you are. Like you could have started this journey today. Yeah. You could start this journey. You mentioned someone who's 63 years old who starts their creative journey. Yeah. I don't think, you know, there's all that saying, the best time to start uh, a, a new creative endeavor is 10 years ago and today. Yeah. And I think that's really important to, to, to note. And again, as part of this Mad Libs approach to creativity. But, um, uh, you know, one thing about community, though, that I'm curious about, when you start entering into the community of photographers, or if you're any creative and you start entering into the community of the creatives, there's a danger point there too, which is you don't necessarily have the ability to judge if this particular group of creatives is good community for you or not. You're not entering just a community, you're entering a hierarchy where we're tribal animals ranked from alpha to omega. And so if you think to yourself, oh, well, I should be... If this guy's getting published his photographs in this magazine, I should be. And, you know, there's a little bit of competition. Not everyone has your best interest at heart. And I could be telling my own story, but I have a feeling I'm telling every creative story. You got to just For be sure. careful when you enter into any hierarchy. There's, sure. there's, there's a ranking and nobody, not everybody wants you to immediately be the alpha. For sure. For sure. And to me, the, the barometer there, the limits is how does it make you feel? Mm, I think that's really important yeah. and connection and um, and inspiration and a little crit like those are all that's a really helpful alchemy those things and there are also communities that feel toxic and where and again this is going to be up to each you know each their own but I think your point is super well taken that this is not a uh, just sign up at the nearest community these are it's not dissimilar to how to decide how to spend your time. Like you want to spend your time doing things that you love around people that you like and with goals in mind that inspire you. And the same is true with the community. I, I think this is such an important point because, and I don't, and, and by the way, it's not, I'm not saying this from the point of view of someone who, who did it. I think I spent at least a good 12 to 15 years not doing that, not paying attention to how, certain people or situations made me feel and that threw me off path. Now, fortunately I was able to bring all those experiences eventually back onto the path, but they were certainly experiences I could have avoided if I paid attention more to how different situations and people made me feel. And I was deluded by thinking, okay, I have to be around these people because maybe there's money and I have to take care of a family. Yep. And I yeah. just, Again and again, I made the wrong decisions for myself, uh, and it's my and the fault is not. The fault really boils down to not paying attention to how certain people made me feel or certain yeah. situations, and it's not their fault. It's my fault that I didn't no, pay more attention to this. But I, I don't don't beat yourself up because we're taught culturally that there is that the answers are out there and it's a very external and you get validated and you fit into tribes and all all those other things and. And I think that's part of being awake enough to hear what we're supposed to be doing in our lives is a similar level of woke to how does something make us feel. And we, the reality is, you know, the science is pretty clear, rational cognition relative to sort of intuition. Like rational is really slow and la la loaded with biases and all these things that we, we basically over-index and give it, give it too much credit. And yet when you have a feeling about somebody, sometimes you get proved wrong, but you know, like it doesn't matter. It's not really a matter of right or wrong. Is this person good or bad? It's just you should decide to spend time and energy on things that feel good and matter to you rather than something that doesn't. And if you're going to be too loud for some people, you're going to be too fill in the blank for other people. 
the challenge is understanding that those just then aren't your people mm. and start to find who are your people and what can you do to trust that intuition. To me, that's, you know, there's a handful of metaphors in the book, some, you know, conceptual and others really like right on the nose. And two that come to mind are listening to this calling. And it's not always some trumpet that's 10 feet in front of you. It's a whisper and that whisper is inside of you. And it, it doesn't look or feel like a map because a map shows you I'm here and I'm going to follow this path and I'm going to end up here. It's way more a compass. And a compass is just an arrow that gets you in a direction, right? It's, 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 I, I can't stand it. Like you're using all the words I use. It is a compass and it is, the compass is determined. Oh, you step in this direction, you feel it. You step in this direction, you don't feel it. I think it's very, for me, it was very hard to learn that compass. Yeah. Now I feel a little bit more aware of it, yeah. but that was a very, a big difficulty of mine. And in, you know, and that, and that's that balance of, am I going for validation? Am I going for money? Am I going for internal improvement and skill acquisition and, and joy? It was very hard to, for me it, to balance all of these things. I'm, I'm going to tell a short story that sews together a couple of those things. And my intuition, so let's go back to my career as a photographer. I was at the peak of my photographic career and it's as good, it's better than you can possibly imagine when you're in the top very teeny weeny percent of photographers. It is all of the travel, all whatever you're thinking, it's better. Okay, I'll just say that. And I was experiencing a little bit of burnout. And I noticed something that was happening in culture. And I had a, a palm trio. And the palm trio, the newest one, was shipped with a camera. It had a little camera. It was 0. 0.3 megapixels. You really couldn't, if you took a picture with the thing, you could barely, the resolution on the screen and, and ultimately the camera was so bad, you could sometimes not actually even be aware of what you took a picture of, it just like a fuzzy thing. But I started getting so much joy of always having that camera in my pocket because it was my phone. Hmm. And you got to keep in mind, I have hundreds of thousands of dollars of the very finest photograph equipment that you can possibly have in the world. And I started getting joy from having a camera on me at all times. And I could take pictures of the donut while I was waiting in line to get my morning coffee and, and just whatever inspired me when I saw the light hit. And that's not something you get from carrying around a hundred thousand dollar digital Hasselblad. You have to like, there's a whole crew that comes with that thing and you set it up and you have computers and monitor, and it's just, there's all this burden. And I remember thinking, you know, one of the things I find so much joy in it, it, it initially it was the Palm Trio and then it was the razor. And then it was the first iPhone is wow. Like I'm not burdened with X, Y, and Z, but you know what else? This is never going to amount to anything because it's virtually useless, this camera, but it feels good. So I'm going to keep doing it. Go back to your compass story. That ended up being one of my biggest professional, both successes and failures of all time. I did the first iPhone app that allowed you to take a picture, add a cool thing called a filter and share it to social media. And it was the first photo feed in the best camera app, I had to get special approval from Apple to be able to send photos in real time out to an audience who would consume and, and view them. And I, it, it ended up being the app of the year in the Apple iStore, in, in iTunes store in 2009. I sold millions of those things and they were three bucks a piece. It was a money factory. And most importantly, it came from something that I was sure was going to be useless because I had all these external beliefs of what was valuable and not valuable. And I just decided in a rare whim of actually listening to myself that this felt good. Yeah, because because you loved, I mean, just think from the perspective of when you started, imagine if you had something in your pocket that could take amazing pictures. Like yes. the phones we have now are probably <laughs> as good as the equipment you, you had for 20 sure. years ago for or sure. better. I don't yeah, know. For sure. And, and... It was an amazing thing. Like people, I started using Instagram, which yeah. followed your app, yeah, yeah. best best camera. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so, but it's interesting though because your your sense of photography, your expertise in it, brought you to this use case for the world. <laughs> but you didn't have, you hadn't racked up yet the let's call it the ten thousand hours of business expertise, sure, which is a common thing, yep. you know where you don't, people don't even realize business is a skill, but it is. And you made kind of 
the basic mistakes you can't even blame yourself but but like yeah. what were some of the mistakes you made uh most of I mean, this- I mean again we're saying the mis- mistakes because <laughs> a very similar app called Instagram got sold for a billion dollars right after your yeah. thing disappeared. Yep, right. And and that's chronicled in the book. Again, this is part of like not trying to gold plate my story. My story is one of pitfalls and as all of our stories are. Um, but yeah, the, the mistakes that I ultimately made, I don't even think I could have foreseen them because they were around very technical uh, contract elements about when you were going to do you were trying to write a contract today that was going to see what future versions of the software were going to have to be like. And so because software changes so much, you can't realize that in two years, I'm going to want to be able to follow and like my friends mm. because it's just, you don't have it. You can't really see around the corner. Social networks didn't really hadn't, hadn't matured at that point. So I don't throw myself on a bus too hard. And I think that's part of, um, I, I definitely did make some very fundamental mistakes. Like I gave my, um, even though contractually I owned the IP, I had hired a developer and the software, I didn't have a copy of it on my own servers. This, the software lived on their servers. I used their Apple iTunes account to publish the thing to the store. So I didn't actually get the metrics. I got a check from them after they received a check from Apple. There's a bunch of little technical things that led to my demise. Um, and for that, I'm both not a billionaire and and disappointed, but also like that's a learning experience that I was then able to leverage into creative live because I, I learned I learned a ton from that. But right. the reason I went down this path and or the story was this thing that I thought was it couldn't amount to anything. And yet I was obviously deeply intrigued at the intersection of creativity and technology and convenience and uh, um it 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 inter- it was the intersection of all these things that I loved especially relative to what I had grown reasonably bored with despite being at the top of my profession. And I just pursued it anyway out of, because it felt good. It was the compass that said, when I did this, I felt better. I remember intellectualizing that, ah, nothing can really come of this. And yet it was arguably one of my biggest professional successes to sort of be a pioneer in mobile photography. So, so, you know, it seems like the, the, there's several critical things. One is finding where your compass is pointing um, building up the basic skills, which you discuss a lot in the book, like how you can do that, like, you know, find the photographers you admire, sure, deconstruct find their work. Yeah. yeah find the, the, the things you like to photograph, photograph the, the very question you asked me when we, when we first met, what, what do I like to look at? That's probably what I would like to photograph, giving yourself kind of increasing challenges, um, for you going into, you know, extreme action sports scenarios where, sure. where nobody else will go taking those photographs. Yep. You go to the place least crowded, that's where you're going to be the best as yeah. you develop these skills. Uh, and then, you know, seeing where it takes you. But I'm always intrigued. But, oh, and then, you know, again, finding the community of people you yeah. can learn from and, and, yeah. and benefit from. But I'm always wondering, like, let's say someone's listening to this. They're 40, 50, 60 years old. They want to, they, they've kind of, maybe for whatever reason, good or bad, blocked out or not listen to that inner flame yeah. or that that compass. Yeah. How do you how do you start to listen to it when when it's been so long? Right. First of all, you're not alone. Mm. That's the thing that you need to know is that there are more people that are like you than are not like you that denied this part of themselves or that uh eschewed it because it was not practical. And I'm here to tell you that creativity is the most practical lever that you have in your life again it can it can unlock um areas of life that you didn't know or existed it can help personally like, transform you to me creativity is so fundamental it's as fundamental as exercise or nutrition right and we're creating machines and by not even acknowledging that you are creative and that you have agency over what you do and don't do and how you spend your time or don't spend your time you you sort of cram down and ignore that beautiful sixth grade or that sorry first grade six-year-old self that said, I want to come up to the front of that room and draw a picture. And it's not just that you suppress it and nothing happens. That sort of eats away at you. It's because we're fundamentally human creating machines. So by telling people that they're not alone, this is a, this, this is a lie that you were sold a long time ago when it wasn't convenient for culture. It was inconvenient for it to have a bunch of wildly creative 
uh, people who questioned the status quo. And so we had, we, we had a school system, we had an employment system that were different. It's fine. I'm just here to say that now, even though you're not alone, now is the right time. And it, this does not mean giving up, you know, you have to move into a different house or move to Paris or get a new set of friends. That is the wrong vision that you have of creativity. What creativity means is acknowledging that you're a creator and that you can put two more things together to form something that's new, new and useful. And reality says you do it every single day. You're just not acknowledging it. So the first thing I want you to do is to call yourself a creator. Words matter. And if you understand that you say, oh, I'm not really all that creative, that's fine. Maybe you think of yourself as a math head, but just so you know, math is wildly creative. Wildly creative. Science, all science is like, the wheel is mechanical engineering plus creativity. Like we've just been fed a definition that creativity equals painting. And that's not the case. So one, when you start thinking of yourself as this infinite creative superpower, you've got this little core of creative plutonium in you and you just really haven't used that. What's cool is the, this is the one resource, this is a ripoff of a Maya Angelou quote, where the more you use, the more you get. It's not something that's depleted, it's something that's empowered. And if you can start to think about that, it doesn't matter if you're 18, 35, 55, or 95. Like acknowledging and putting that creative muscle to work is, is becomes effective today. The first time you do it a second time, you've seen a benefit from creativity, even if you took a step backwards, because you're exercising the muscle that ultimately will shape your life. So, 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 you know, and this goes along with what you're, what you say throughout the book, which is daily, and you really cement this at the end, but daily creativity, doing something that you consider creative, more creative than your normal output, doing something every single day that's creative. What would be, if someone again is just clueless on where the compass is pointing them, they want to know, sure. they're listening to it, they want to sure. know, what are some things they can try? What are, what are let's call them experiments. What are some sure. experiments or ways to think about experiments, depending on how abstract we want to get, sure. that someone can do today? Sure. So I would actually bet that 90, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 90% of the people listening right now have taken a photograph with their phone in the past 24, maybe 48 hours. And it might even have been taking a picture of your, a receipt to submit for your expense report at Deloitte. If you thought of that, even for a moment, that what I'm doing right now is choosing this thing, I'm choosing to take a photograph and express myself. If you can take, you can lift that phone up from that receipt and take a picture of anything within your field of view, do it with a little bit of intention, that will create, that is a little creative moment that you are choosing. And again, that might not be your ultimate creative expression, but what that will do is realize that you just made a choice and that in that choice you have agency. And in agency, you can see that you could do this again and again. So you don't have to look far. When you're preparing a meal for your family tonight and you're tired, you got home from work, kids are hungry, the whatever you know narrative that each of us have, if you think of that as an opportunity to just do one thing a little different, to add one little special either spice or presentation or you can get joy from that. And that is that is just awakening that muscle. And then if you decide that I get more joy from cooking and less from photography or more joy from playing the guitar than I do from coding, then start to do more of the thing that brings you joy. And what I'm hearing right now in someone's mind in, I think it's in Indiana, they're saying, I don't have time. I've got the kids. I've got, I got no extra time in my day. Great. What are you doing? Like cooking, you, do you, do you have to prov provide for your family and put food on the table? Yeah. Great. There's no extra time involved. This is a mindset shift. You can acknowledge that instead of just making the Kraft macaroni and cheese out of the box, maybe you went to the store and you bought some special pasta or maybe even gasp, you made your own pasta. My belief is that the kids are probably going to say, wait a minute, I like the craft better. But your husband, your partner, or on your own, you can say, you know what, that was, I, I brought me joy. And I don't know, I don't, I'm not trying to be prescri prescriptive of what the joyful thing is. I'm saying that if you can find those things, it doesn't actually take extra time. It takes just an awareness and a mind shift that you can start to immediately get value. You know, um, I can't believe I just got the sign to wrap. Jay, have we actually been going for 90 minutes? <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, there's so much stuff I want to yeah, yeah, cover. No, that's good. I, 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 I'm, let's let's make a lot of value in this last ten minutes. Let me see. I'm gonna I'm gonna look. I I've got un- things underlined. I got things folded. <laughs> um, well, f- I, I'm, while you're looking for a thing, James, that is in the book, um, you're flipping through. I, I want to say that before we recorded, and you said. Like I look at you as wildly creative. You're an amazing writer. You've mastered that stand-up comedy. You've built businesses, business after business, and that the book resonated with you as like there's like truth in here. To me, that that's helpful. I right, really appreciate I, it. I thought this was almost like like even when you use words like compass, which I've used as well. I felt like this was an outline for how I've approached my creative efforts. Uh, you know. One thing that you write about that's really interesting is what you call rejection therapy, like mm. kind of trying to do things that are going to get you rejected. Because yeah. A, you build up that muscle of being able to handle rejection and perhaps learn from it. Yeah. But I think also if you're trying to be creative at something and you want to, there's no shortcuts, but I'm going to say if you want to skip the line in ability, yep. Yep. you don't want to take the safe path. You want to go where... It's if you were given the choice to do this or to do another thing with your creativity, you would take the harder choice. So in in comedy, you know, the, a, a night of stand up comedy is usually seven or eight comedians perform. The third spot, the fourth spot, the audience is warmed up. They're not too drunk. There's not so much noise. They're ready for you. The worst spot is called the check spot. It's towards the end. It's they're tired. They're drunk. Yeah. So they're all talking to each other rather than listening to you, and you have to perform and you get crushed if they don't laugh, but they're not going to laugh. They're figuring out their tip. They're doing math. (laughs) So, so the way to get better is to always take the check spot or to perform after the world famous comedian. You perform after Jerry Seinfeld. No one cares about you. They're thinking about Jerry Seinfeld. So if you're given the choice, do you go before or do you go after you go after? Cause that's where you're going to learn is those challenges. And I'm just mentioning, I think we all want to improve as fast as possible, but it's not easy. You have to do these very specific hard challenges. Yeah. You have to plan on it. You have to plan what's going to be the <laughs> challenge and what I do next. Like I, if I just write an article like, oh, this, 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 if it's the same as everyone else's, it's not going to improve me. If it's something that I'm afraid to publish, that will probably improve me. If it's, yeah. if it's, if it's time I'm afraid to perform, if it's a, a speaking engagement, I'm, I'm afraid to do because it's an audience I've, I have no experience with. Those are the things that will improve me. And I'm, I'm just curious yeah. your, your, your take on that. So I think um, being willing to be uncomfortable is a huge um, opportunity. And it's for all the reasons that you just cited. And I think just generally we have a biology that is doing two things. One, it's out there to make us uh, alive, not happy. And two, it's designed to keep us safe. So it's always dragging us. No, 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 you don't want to do that. No, 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 you really don't want to be uncomfortable. It's just dragging you right back to the middle. Right, and- yeah, right. You, you have this like surge in cortisol, <laughs> right. which is actually painful. Right. And and there's only two ways to solve that surge. One is to give up. That is, there's no problem. You yeah. don't have to have that cortisol, just give up. Yeah. And the other is to kind of do it yeah. and get good at doing it yeah and you know i think under recognizing that going out and doing the stand-up in the check spot it's not it's not like what your biology is fighting against is a saber-toothed tiger and there is no saber-toothed tiger at the camp comedy club if people are not laughing hysterically at your joke because they're doing math around what the tip they're going to give to the server like that isn't about you necessarily and it's certainly not about a tiger this is about being willing to make yourself uncomfortable and to develop that muscle, that habit of being willing to do it over and over and over. And that is certainly a mechanism for quick growth, as you talked about. Where did you do it in photography? Um, I did shows way before I was ready to do shows. I put my work on the walls of coffee shops that would, um, anyone who'd give me the time of day. I did um, slideshows. I held very public slideshows at a time where my work was very immature. Um, and I don't mean that in like a child, childish, but just like not mature as in development as an artist. And all of those things, they both came with joy of doing something and some rejection. Um, and, you know, there's a countless examples in my past. And I think, 
you know, part of what I, I tell a story in the book about a guy named Jia Zhang, and he's written a book, and he had a very, really, really cool angle at this was he um, he found rejection professionally after a series of just crushing defeats in at his startup, and set out to cultivate what he calls rejection therapy. And the book chronicles this little story. And he goes, he I think it's, I forget how many days in a row, it's maybe a hundred days of rejection. I think that might, might have been his chronicle of it. And he does things like ask, he tried to get, tries to get rejected every day. And it gets so absurd that people are saying yes to the most absurd things that he can possibly make up, of which he asked a cop if he could drive the cop car. <laughs> and the cop said yes. He asked uh Krispy Kreme donuts. He's like, I really like the donuts here, but you know, it is the Olympics right now. And I was wondering, could you make me the five Olympic ring donuts in the right colors? And the person was like, um, hmm, went and got the manager and they did it. Mm. Like, like these things, these are crazy things. And so it does two things. One, it's really the asking that makes us uncomfortable or in Jia Zhang's case, asking to drive the police car because you think, am I going to get arrested? Am I going to And then when things start actually happening for you, you got the benefit of both. You got the benefit of making yourself so uncomfortable that you ask a cop if you can drive his car and you realize that people want to help you when you do crazy shit. You and know? and the, <laughs> like the net do. result also... It's creative. Yeah, and it's... Like you got to drive a cop car and then write about it and then write a book about it. Right, for sure. And so, uh, you know, I think for me, that is like rejection therapy and getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Like I take ice baths every morning if I'm at my home in Seattle, I have a cold plunge where I get in it and it's 50 degrees or 40 something degrees. And I don't do that. I mean, sure, there's all kinds of other benefits and you can talk to Tony Robbins or Tim Ferriss about that. I do it because it's like every morning, am I willing to be uncomfortable for like five minutes? And if like this morning, turn on, you know, take a hot shower, do what you need to do, clean, and then just cold. And it's, ne I never am like, you know what? I can't wait for that cold water, but I do it every day. Cause it's just a reminder that being uncomfortable in small ways, uh, you know, builds that muscle of being uncomfortable in large ways. So Chase, I feel yeah. like we could talk for <laughs> hundreds <laughs> of hours about this. This is like the c c kind of understanding the, DNA of creativity and learning and this compass that we discussed is like, I'm obsessed with this topic mostly because I think I ignored it for so many years and yeah. I was just so miserable. James, we all have, time. we all have. And that's like, I don't want anyone to feel bad for a second. I mean, we all can look in our past and say, oh man, we effed up here and here and here and here. It's not too late. And you're living proof of it. You're living proof of it. You've started like starting stand up comedy. Like we're sitting here in the club. It's amazing. It's inspirational as hell. That's like, I'm, I want to support you because I see you doing those things like Jai Zhang. And I want to make those donuts for you. I want to come show up at your stand up because you're doing something that makes you uncomfortable. And the fact that you have had the success you've had and you're still looking backwards, that tells me that we're all always going to be wanting and wishing a little bit more. It's never too late to start. And the only thing you can do wrong is to deny that that's a part of you and you're not denying it. So fist bump and thank you for being a huge inspiration to me, man. Well, thank you, Chase, for uh, coming on the show. And the book is Creative Calling by Chase Jarvis. The subtitle, Establish a Daily Practice, Infuse Your World with Meaning and Succeed in Work and Life. Again, the book is Creative Calling. I think this is like a Bible of, I do think it's like a blueprint to creativity and thanks for writing and thanks for coming on the show it's a treat man thanks for having me your daily dose of gaming just got way more epic with the snapdragon processor powering the samsung galaxy s23 ultra Snapdragon processors give you the premium mobile experience that triggers your inner champion whenever you want, wherever you want. Get ready for edge of your seat performance, advanced customizations, ultra realistic graphics, and adrenaline boosting speeds that have the power to move you in more ways than one. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.